welcome on into Drinks with Binks. I'm Julie Stewart Binks. This is the show where we gab with some of the biggest names in sports, entertainment, and broadcasting over a bevy of their choice. Sometimes it's booze, sometimes it's water, sometimes we don't really know what is in their cup. And today, my guest has already told me, based on the fact that it is 9 a.m. where she is recording this from, that she would have had a mimosa, but she has to parent some children. She has has to do her job and it's just a little bit early for booze. I think these are all just excuses to be honest. But with that I'm very excited to be able to welcome in someone that you will have remembered from the NFL sidelines and all the work that she's done across many different networks covering the sport but now has transitioned to a different role as a senior vice president head of women's growth with the agency The Family which represents athletes, broadcasters, entertainers in a very different way i'm very excited to welcome in alex flanagan alex thanks for joining us here oh good morning well i'm so sorry to disappoint with my coffee <laughs> and, and maybe i should have put like some kalua or something in it but um like you said we are living in unprecedented times and right now i have two high school girls that are down the hall from me um, and if they come in as they often do let's hope they don't this morning <laughs> asking for me to sign some paperwork or like to help them break down some physics problem which i have no idea how to do um i think it might set a bad example if i've got like some vodka yeah they could just right? smell the booze on your on your breath right in the morning mom <laughs> setting an awesome example and i'm just joking i obviously never push alcohol on people i mean i do all the time and i used to do that outside of the pandemic but i'm a new person <laughs> as well right now happy to be drinking coffee and on that note um what is it like trying to help high school kids with physics Oh my gosh, it has been um, just such a crazy world as everybody knows um, out there that's a parent. I think that we've gone from um, kind of this work life where you're used to having your own time and do something like this with you, um, where you're, you know, you're in a studio or you know that you have this intimate time by yourself. And now I've got my husband working out in the garage. I've got my two girls. My, my son is actually back in school. So we are happy that he is back in school. But um, but yeah, it's, it's bizarre. I mean, it's kind of cool because I get to see them and we don't have that morning rush of like having to get out the door and mm -hmm. it's such a scramble. So I think the one like really big blessing in all of this is just life has slowed down. And I felt like leading into it, like there were days where I barely saw them and they were so busy with like high school stuff and student council and sports. And so now like we try to meet for lunch together. <laughs> like they come out of their rooms at 1240 or whatever their class ends and we try to have lunch. But um, yeah, it's been, I mean, I think there's pros and cons of all of this, right? I think we're trying to find um, the silver lining and then I think there's a lot of days, especially recently for me, where I just have felt a little bit like I'm mourning, I think. Just I'm kind of mourning like life. And I think mm -hmm. high schoolers and us can all relate to just like, we just don't really have the things to look forward to that we used to, like even just like a girl's trip or a birthday party, right? That is a right on the, hit the nail on the head. I was just talking with my boyfriend, like, can we plan to do some pumpkin something. carving on our roof <laughs> yeah. or something just that's like not this exact same thing every single day okay so what about halloween like do we i don't even know with my kids like do we do halloween do we not do halloween are we allowed to get candy maybe there's a way to do it i'm not sure i probably not but i think you could we can all still let's all still dress up at least do you have um, any ideas for them for high school girls um, my daughters are trying to ideate and they need my help and i'm i'm horrible at halloween i don't really do it very well and i hate dressing up what do you, what do you think they were thinking maybe um um Paris Hilton and oh. Nicole Richie. Nicole, yeah, Nicole Richie. They can do like simple life type of thing. They're always looking for like the fun girl stuff. So I think I think they want to do Paris Hilton, and I think maybe one of them brought up Britney Spears. So I think Those it kind of lets, lets them like dress a little fun. It's like depends and... though what what genre of Britney yeah. are we discussing, right? <laughs> like there's... Or either early or later Britney. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really at the stage of like my hair extension. I just pull them out, so I'm I'm that Britney right now, like, <laughs> shaving my head. Um, I'm gonna go for those interested. I'm going. It's the 45th anniversary of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I'm gonna do uh, I'm gonna do Doctor Frankenfurter, but in, in a different. I, I, whatever. This is unrelated to our interview with Alex Flanagan. <laughs> okay, um, we can dive into that and closer to the date, Alex. We just were talking about your new gig right now, and you guys had a big announcement this week. Just tell us, what are you up to these days? 
Yeah, so I'm on um, maybe the other side or the dark side of the business, if you will, um, now representing uh, broadcasters and athletes and musicians. Uh, so our founder is a gentleman named Steve Astafin. Um, he worked at the Wasserman Group as a partner there for many years and um, launched his own agency again. Um, he founded the family way back when and decided to redo it again. So I joined him. It was kind of one of those kind of crazy things. We met for lunch and started talking about different things I wanted to do in my career, you know, having spent 25 years or whatever I am in, in dinosaur years and in, in TV as a broadcaster, I was kind of looking to transition into my next 20 years and figure out really how I could use some of my relationships and some of my credentials and experience to, I guess, kind of you know, have a job and then also pay it forward and, and help other people. So um, we kind of came up with this idea of me becoming an agent. And at first I was like, do I really want to do that? And then the more I thought about it, the more I got really excited. Um, and it has been really fun. I, I One of my clients, Kimberly Martin, is a reporter uh, for ESPN. And of course, yeah. I kind of laugh with her. Um, I feel like I kind of get to do the job vicariously through her without all of like the pressure and having to actually mm -hmm. do it. But I get to like be part of the storylines and help her edit things. And she's been really gracious about um, letting me in and, and kind of be part of her um, life in that way. Well, that's great. Yeah. So you, you have the, the agent mindset, the connections, but then you're also able to offer advice and editorial advice, right? For a number of these sideline reporters or reporters in general, because you have that new sense and that knowledge. And that's a, that's a unique aspect of, of having your background and now doing this, but I have so many more questions I want to ask you. We do have to take a quick time out here on drinks with things. We are sipping on some coffee, by the way, this is vintage. <laughs> Both of us have worked at this network, so... Uh, yes, we have. Yes. That, that Cheers. Is, I was vintage there. <laughs> yes, and and me too at this rate. Okay, uh, we will be back after this quick timeout with Alex Flanagan. Don't go anywhere. I'm Jane Slater. When I drink, it's with Binks. Hey guys, welcome on back to Drinks with Binks. I'm JSB, and we have Alex Flanagan here on the show. You remember her from the sidelines covering NFL, but now she has transitioned into a new role as an agent. And we were discussing sort of your viewpoint and using your experiences to help the clients that you have. Why did you leave broadcasting? And have you completely <laughs> left broadcasting? You know, I think, um, I feel like I kind of liken it to being like a backup quarterback where you just kind of realize like you're, maybe Tom Brady's not a good example, but <laughs> but there comes a time, right, in all of our lives where I think it's just, um, you're kind of ready to, to make uh, a change and do something different. And I think I was so blessed to have had so many years working at a really high level covering Olympics and Super Bowls and getting to be on the Notre Dame sideline. And I just kind of, I felt like maybe there were times where I was getting these assignments where I was kind of gut checking myself because I, I just didn't want to, I didn't want to go to Rio for a month or I didn't want to go to Russia for a month. And, and I started saying like, that's kind of weird because years ago I would have given like my left arm to have done something like that but I was really missing my home life and being away from my kids and I think um you know I, I mentioned I have two high schoolers and a middle schooler and I realized my high schooler was going to be gone in four years and I was on the road a ton and I know that our lives as broadcasters um, sound very glamorous <laughs> and I think that's the <laughs> biggest misconception is it's a really hard job and um you know, you're, it's a grind. And I think kind of given um, the circumstances now, gosh, it's become even more of a grind for a lot of the broadcasters like yourself that I know that are working from home and now having to manage technology and all of that. But um, yeah, I was just, I was kind of ready. I was ready, I tell people to be a little bit of a grown up and um, to not have to worry about some of the pressures of, I think being a woman in our business is challenging. And, you know, I found myself as I'm, you know, in my upper forties now, just really, feeling worried about what I was wearing and, and what my skin looked like and if I'd got my hair dyed and all of that stuff. So I think it was just kind of time to step back and say, how can I use, like, I want to do some other things in my life and um, and use my skills in a different way. So I think I was, I was ready. I don't miss the travel. I mean, not that anybody's mm -hmm. traveling right now very much anyways, but I, I didn't miss the travel. And, and I, I just, I love the people part of it. So I think I'm getting that in the role that I'm in right now. 
Yeah, and and you bring up a, a ton of really good points there. And, <laughs> and just to jump in on one, um, you know, what is it? I mean, we, you know, I spent like an hour on like my hair and makeup right now to look completely not like myself um, for this. But like, what have you found when you're, you know, your career is so illustrious, you've worked at all these different networks. What have you found was sort of like the response from executives when you are growing up in front of a camera, like when you are when you're aging, like what have they you, you mentioned it was sort of like, you know, you're worried about what you're wearing, what your skin look like, like what what's what is that like? Like because I know, you know, even from I'm thirty three years old, I'd see executives being like, here's Damn a nineteen you. year old, like they're already shipping you off to like greener pastures. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think you've like read about that in the entertainment world for a long time with actresses, right? And I think it definitely applies. You know, I think we're making baby steps. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely, it's a hard business to age in. And I think that there's there comes a point <laughs> in your 40s where you're like, okay, like I actually can't look like I'm 30 anymore, like no matter how hard I try. Um, and I just find that there's still... Um, a disparity between my male colleagues, like the experience and what they were rewarded for. So they get really mm -hmm. rewarded for experience and contacts and relationships and all these things. And then I was at the same place that they were, but yet like I'm looked at totally differently. And and I think that, I, I don't know, I mean, I'm, I'm part of so many of these conversations now as I'm serving on a few diversity and inclusion committees and have kind of really gotten into that world. And I, I think it's kind of, we all have the same conversations, whether it's advancing black people or women or, or, or different um, ethnicities. I think it all comes down to the same thing. It's kind of extending your circles so that the people that are that are hiring, you know, don't necessarily, they're not one person, I guess. They're not all, mm -hmm. you know, most of my bosses have been middle-aged white men. So mm -hmm. I think there's less of a, um, understanding of what it's like to be a woman, I guess. So I think until we have more people in those positions, um, it won't change, right? Yeah, definitely. And and I mean, dudes can basically like die on air, like they can right. be on air until they're in like a corpse. And it's like a woman gets like one wrinkle. They're like, well, honey, like you, you're not, you can't be on camera anymore. You better do radio or something. That's like, what the fuck? That's so like, <laughs> like, like that's 2020 still. Um, I'm very fortunate to have a female boss who uh, that is where a lot of these changes start, right? Is, is having women in power in those positions. And I would be curious though, like you, you wrote a great article on your website, alexflanagan.com. And anyone who's interested in more about Alex's journey, insight, advice, I highly recommend that you check it out. And you have, uh, you wrote about um, what it's like to be a sideline reporter. And I would, I, I would be curious, like, um, I guess there's many things with this, but like what, when you looked at Dak Prescott's injury the other day, no. you talked about the different things you had in place if someone had like an injury, like the hospitals and the sources you had, when you saw him go down the way he did and then like ensuing aftermath, in what way did your mind sort of track back to like, what would I have done on the sideline? Yeah, totally. Well, it's funny because I, I, so first of all, alexflanagan.com came about because I, as a sideline reporter, which was one of my roles for many years, I found myself having so much information and I would work so hard as I kind of outlined in that piece. And you walk away as a sideline reporter and you're like, wow, I've got so many great stories and so much great information. I never got to use it. And I really love writing. It's kind of therapy for me. So I was like, I'm going to start my own thing and just for the fun of it, kind of write some stuff on there when I feel like it. So it just was kind of an outlet for me. And, and now in the position I'm in, I feel like I can really... Um, utilize it to give back some information because I'm sure you're asked a lot also like how do I get into this business what's it like how do I prepare for stuff so I think I can use some of my experience to lay that out for people that want to do it but yeah so going back to DAC I mean I was watching it at home with my son and um, I just felt like that was one of those injuries and I don't know why that we just like you kind of felt sick to your stomach and I don't know if it's because of who he is or because of his contract situation or or it was pretty bad of, too. Yeah, it yeah, was the pretty nature gross. Of the yeah, it was. But terrible. yeah, and the way he's crying. Yeah, it was just you just hate. I mean, I know people that work in our industry. Like you get to know these young men and people, and you just pull for them. So I guess that's part of it too. Um, but but so yeah, like your mind immediately is like the sideline reporter's job at that point is to try and deliver to your viewers. 
um, what the injury is, the extent of it. And you're kind of in this crazy moment. And there's a lot of pressure in that moment because now you've got these insiders at different networks. So there's kind of an expectation that your producer really wants you to have that information for the broadcast. And, and yet you're still on air. So you're trying to balance getting information sometimes from the team who doesn't even, you know, I would have times in my career where I had information and the team didn't want me to put it out. So you're in this weird position of like, okay, I can't really piss off the team. Mm. So I kind of have to sit on the information and then you've got like, you know, Adam Schefter, somebody is tweeting it. And then people are like, well, Alex is right there at the game. Why doesn't she know it? And Adam Schefter is tweeting. You're like, I do know it, but I can't say. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you kind of go get into action. And I think that was a big part of my role as a sideline reporter is one of the things I'd learned was make sure that you know kind of where the ambulance is located. So that if when, an, when a player like Dak gets taken off, you then as the reporter kind of follow and watch mm -hmm. to see, are they taking him into the locker room? Are they taking him straight into the ambulance? And then that's part of your your report. And, you know, in super serious situations, I mean, there's so many things that can happen at a football game. Um, so just knowing like you're kind of, I mean, think back to the Super Bowl where there was a blackout in New Orleans, right? right. And all of a sudden as a sideline reporter, that's really when you, like the, you know, the lights go on, not to, <laughs> not to try and make that stupid parallel to a blackout, but, um, it's kind of all of a sudden, like, that's your time. And it's a weird yeah. role because for so, uh, so often you're not really important to the broadcast. And then all of a sudden you're really important and you better, like, you better be able to like be boots on the ground and be the person to do it. And so in, in like that Super Bowl situation, it's like, you better kind of know who to talk to at that point and, and, and have some phone numbers and whatnot to start you know, being able to work it to formulate a report as to what's happening. So there's a lot, right, of, yeah. a lot of preparation that goes into it. And I don't think many people really appreciate um, like good sideline reporters, just how much work they put into just all the like standby, what if this happens? <laughs> Yeah, the amount of contacts you have of just in case this happens, or as as you mentioned, this happens, and then now you are you're not a, you're not an NFL sideline reporter anymore. Like you're a weather specialist, or yeah. you're like a turf <laughs> specialist, or you're you're. It's a lot of improv um, in that regard. And there's a lot more I want to get to on your career in NFL, but we have to take a quick time out. We'll have a whole lot more at the Alex Flan again on Drinks and Things. I'm Katie Nolan, and I had drinks with Banks, and I loved it. Hey, guys, welcome back to Drinks with Binks. I'm Julie Stewart Binks. We've got Alex Flanagan here. And Alex, you most recently wrote a piece uh, about detailing an experience you had when you worked oh, Sunday no. Night Football. And <laughs> I'm not mentioning the person that is involved in this because we're not giving airtime to jerks. But you wrote a, a piece that I think resonated with the likes of other female reporters, Katie Dolan, Maria Taylor. What was the response like when you discussed the misogynism you received and and sort of the hate that you received on social media platform while doing your job? Kind of sad because it wasn't only women um, that reached out to me. It was some men, too, whose careers had been you know, drastically changed by people that had targeted them in a really negative way. Um, so I think I think it, it was interesting. I, I I guess now I'm like old enough and in a job where I can speak up. And so when I saw that hate towards people like Maria Taylor and, and she had already received things about her outfit the week before, which like made me so mad. <laughs> yeah. So I just feel like um, I was able to speak up and 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 stand up for people. And I think you know, in the whatever 10 years since that happened to me, I, I don't feel like people were able to speak up um, because I think mm -hmm. you would have some ramifications from, I don't know, like I just, so I just thought it was um, important to kind of support those women and, and speak up on their behalf. So, um, so I did, and then it, it got a lot of attention, which I was kind of surprised about. I didn't expect it to get so much attention. And, um, and then I, like you, like just kind of shut it down because I was like, I don't really want to make this a thing, but I did want to stand up for people and say like, this happens, it shouldn't happen, and I hope you all know it happens. Yeah, I think it was very powerful, and especially with your experience and um, just the level that you worked at, so many women would, would really appreciate hearing your words. And um, on that note, you are also, which I very much like, because I do this, but you're very vocal politically. And <laughs> what's your approach Sorry. to... 
oh my god no i'm like yeah go alex like you know quote tweet trump um california is good um what what's your approach to to dealing with politics on social media well you'll laugh because you know i've had to be kind of careful and i think we all do and especially now i'm in a role working with athletes where we're trying to teach them about social media and so I've had with my children all along, like I've kind of tried to teach them how to be sensitive on social media. So when I get on Twitter now, they're like, mom, don't, don't say that. Stop it. Don't do that. Do not do that. <laughs> and I just, um, yeah, I just feel, I guess politically, like, I, you know, I do feel like there, there comes a time when like you're either on the right or the wrong side of history. And I think that when you work in an industry like the NFL and a lot of your colleagues are black and you kind of get to see through their eyes and hear their stories and understand um, what that's like. And one of my early mentors in my life was a 50 year old black woman in Montgomery, Alabama, when I had a job um, at working as a news reporter there and got to hear her stories about what it was like growing up in a segregated Montgomery, Alabama. and really learn and, and, and just feel, I guess you just feel the pain behind people mm -hmm. and the pain of their lives. And so I just, I guess that's affected me and I just kind of feel like speaking out. And I think that, you know, one of the nice things about not working for a big corporation now, like the NFL or NBC Sports, um, I'm able to, and I think our founder, you know, I'm politically aligned a little bit with him and he's kind of supports that. Um, Steve doesn't, you know, he's, he's outspoken. So there's a place for it, I guess. And I just feel like it's time for us to speak out and start supporting mm -hmm. each other um, in, in a kind way. Cause I just think that, I think it's time that we have equality and it's time that people feel supported. And when black people speak the way that they do and we hear their stories and like see their pain, we have a problem in this country. I just think we do. And I think we all have to fix it. Black people alone can't fix it. You know, white people have to be part of the solution. Yeah, man. Uh, Alex Flanagan, uh, can I vote for you this year <laughs> in the election? Um, I'm Canadian. I can't. But yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for your very strong words. Um, not to you know make light of it, but I think it's very important that you have that stance and that you 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 know bring that to what your work now with everything. Because I know I'm sure social media and politics has changed many many times over and again since you entered the industry. We have to take our final time out on the program, but we have more. With I'll explain again on drinks with things. Don't go anywhere. Hi, I'm Cassidy Hubbard, a host and reporter with ESPN, and I just had drinks with Binks, my dear friend Julie Stewart Binks. I loved every second of it. We've had an awesome time drinking and binking with Alex Flanagan, formerly of the NFL sidelines, currently an agent. And Alex, where can we find you next? Yeah, so, okay, I'm going to give you my socials. First of all, the family is the agency. So it's, uh, I guess, kind of familia, familia, yes. uh, F-A-M-I-L-I-E. -E. So spelled with an I-E instead of a Y. So that's the family underscore is our Instagram. And then uh, my Instagram's at, um, it's Alex dot flanagan listen to me i can barely even get my handles out but <laughs> i barely remember mine because i made them both different too which was a mistake which you can't change them now because then you're screwed but thank you alex so much and guys make sure you check out more with alex flanagan her website is incredible alexflanagan.com and also make sure you check out more amazing content with drinks with banks at fubo sports on twitter instagram and youtube and we have a uh, we have just so much content. Really, we do. So make sure you check those out, and we will see you next time. Bottoms up, bitches. <laughs>